Hi class, wanted to bring you up to date on some of the passages from Livy's Ab Urbe Condita that we've been covering lately. This is all on page 159 of uh, Wheelock's Latin re re Reader, I should say, starting at uh, line 214. And this is again from the second book, uh, and we're talking about Lars Porcena. Uh, but we're not talking about him right now, we're actually talking about who will be the hero of our tale, Gaius Mucius Skywola. So he's the subject but, um, of the verb, but let's get started from the very beginning. Dane, which is, of course, we know short for deinde, which means from that point. This is a nice connective saying, next, then. Metuans. So, again, we should always know any vowel preceding ns in Latin is long. So metuans, what does that mean? Well, that means fearing, active. So that's a nominative, active, masculine participle. Not uh, uh, masculine, we, we know because we know the subject, but this ending is ambiguous. It could be any gender, technically. All right, so then fearing, and then we have ne, and we remember that ne is the kind of opposite of ut. It's starting one of these clauses, but why do we have ne here? Well, it's because this is a verb of fearing, and this starts a clause of fearing. Well, let's think about what is the nature of fear? Fear is kind of something that you don't want to happen, right? I fear global warming. I fear nuclear holocaust. So fearing is, in a certain way, saying you hope that not. I hope my desire for the future is that there's no you know, nuclear holocaust or something like that. So your fearing is desiring not, and that not gets caught up in this nay. So even though it's a fear clause, and we're going to translate this, fearing that, this nay kind of captures some of that negative feelings about the fear. And then we're going to get an oot clause later, starting here. So that's going to be a kind of more positive... Or, sorry, that, that's completely wrong. That's a different oot. We can ignore what I was just saying there. I don't even know where that oot clause is. I think that's in a different part of this whole speech. So let's not worry about it right now, knowing that this nay equals negative oot, but in this case gets translated positively. So then fearing that if, so I'm going to mark all these kind of grammatical things in this turquoise, leave the uh, word stuff to this kind of, I don't even know, magenta that we have here. So lest if consulum in usu et ignaris omnibus irat, so that's our if clause. We'll get back to how we know that in just a second. Forte de prehensus a custodibus Romanis retraretur ut transfuga. So that's the fear, but the fear actually, you know, we, we can at least cut that off right now. We might need to add to it later, but we've ended our fear clause. All right, so let's get back to kind of word by word Latin. So then fearing that if, and this is a ablative, fourth declension along you here, uh, but we're, as uh, Richard Lafleur, the editor of our uh, book, kind of tells you, this is an adverbial usage of this ablative. So it simply means unordered, without orders, and then somebody's giving these orders. These orders belong to somebody, and this is our genitive modifying in usu in a way. So unordered of the consuls. So remember, it's consul, consulus, masculine, singular, third declension. So we have this U-M, it looks like it could be accusative, but it's not, it's genitive plural. And it's masculine because consul is. So if unordered, we might say by the consuls, but without orders from the consuls might be a more accurate way to put it. And ignaris omnibus. So we have an ablative here, here we've got another ablative plural, uh, and so we're, we're talking about a situation here. These are kind of situational ablatives. So we've got without orders belonging to the consuls, no orders from the consuls, and with everyone, this is all the Roman citizens, being ignorant. Uh, there's no form of the ver verb being here, but we, we might just say with the, all the Romans ignorant of what he's doing, that is, he were to go. Iret. So what does that come from? Eo, the verb to go. Ire. So then when we have the second principal part, that is the present active infinitive, uh, what we have here, just adding on the personal ending, the T, this is our imperfect subjunctive. 
And this is all part of the if clause. We're not talking about reality, we're talking about a possible scenario. So if he were to go without orders of the consuls and with everyone being ignorant, forte, perhaps, deprehensus. So we know the word apprehend. Uh, this is kind of to put one's hands on. So deprehend means he's been handled, he's been caught. So perhaps having been caught, so what kind of participle is this? It's past tense that ends in that one of these uses, us a uh, um, these first and second declension adjectives. So we, we know the verb, if we were to look it up, is deprehendo, and this is the fourth principal part, which is the perfect passive participle. So we had up here the active present participle. I guess I could put present up here. And when we say present or past, or, or sorry, present or perfect, we're not talking absolute tense. We're saying that these things are relative to the actual thing that's going on. So having been apprehended, having been caught before something else, before the main action of the verb, but we'll get to what that verb is soon. So then fearing lest, or fearing that does not happen, if without orders of the consuls and with everyone being ignorant, he were to go, perhaps having been caught by the custodibus Romanis, by the Roman guards, retaretur. So that's our verb of this, of this fearing clause. So he fears that he will be brought back. So I guess maybe I can bring that back to it. A turquoise, because we're talking grammatically. This is our verb of fearing clause. This retaretur. So by the Roman guards that he would be brought back as, and this is just simply adverbial here, so maybe I can mark this in a kind of yellow. We've got these adverbial bits already in the sentence. So if in this way he were to go, unordered by the consuls and with everyone ignorant, in this way is a good way to kind of, or in such a way, in such a manner, some way that's affecting the action of the verb, that's what the adverbs do. So that's also forte, perhaps. Maybe he would be caught and brought back by the Roman guards as a transfuga, as somebody who's fled, a turncoat. Fortuna tum urbis crimen ad firmante. So, fortuna could be nominative or ablative, feminine, singular. We don't know until we get to ad firmante, and then we say, ah, this is an ablative absolute. So, this is our subject of that abs ablative absolute. This is our verb, again, active, present participle. This is in the ablative. We can see that from this E, short E ending. So, with fortune affirming, and then we need a direct object of this affirmation. So, this is the so within the ablative absolute, I, I'll write AA, that's the subject. This is the ablative absolute verb, and this is the ablative absolute direct object. So with fortune affirming, confirming, we might say, the cremen. So of course this is where we get the word crime, but you know, there are many ways we might translate this, but his action, his guilt. And then urbis. So we have a what's this? We have orbs. Sorry, I forgot the S there, urbs, urbis. Feminine, third declension noun. So we know that this is looks a lot like that form. It's the genitive singular. But what's it working with? Fortuna or crimen? Well, we have to work with context here. There's no Latin word order that will guarantee that this goes with either of these nouns. We know it's going with fortuna because that's, that's what makes more sense. With the fortune of the city, because of course they're under siege and low on food, uh, confirming his crime. I mean, if you were just walking outside the gates of Rome as a transfuga, nobody would say, oh, oh, you're a turncoat, you're hurting things. But if your city's starving and you're leaving, people would be, you know, correct to p potentially correct to assume your guilt of leaving the city, abandoning it, abandoning it in its time of need. And then tomb, just at that time, nice kind of adverb within that. So the fortune at that time of the city affirming his guilt. Ad senatum adit. So here, hey, this is our main verb. We finally got there. Yay. That's how Latin works. We get you know, 20 words, then we finally have our main verb. So we have Skywola, that's Gaius Mucius, fearing that all this thing happened. So I guess we put this here, but really we might say that the fear clause truly ends here. This is the scenario that he's imagining. Okay, if I leave, all of this could happen. <laughs> So instead, I am going audit present 
but probably a historical present tense. He approaches the Senate, and in class today we talked about this odd. It's a, what is it? Well, it's a preposition. It's also kind of an adverb. We have this verb, it, which is the same verb as ir at here. It means at-o, to go, and then this means go toward. So it could be an approach, and that allows the senatum, which is accusative singular, masculine because of it's senatus, it's a masculine noun, um, go to the senate. That's approach. So the ad takes care of it here. So that's this whole sentence that we've been slaving over, finally illuminated by this main verb at the very end. So let's grant, uh, scroll down and see the rest. So transire tiberum inquit patres et entrare si possum castra hostium volo. Let's stop there. So to cross the Tiber, and we, we'd said in class this is a special form of the accusative. It's not worth memorizing all the you know declensions of strange nouns. This is just know that this is the accusative singular of Tiber, and that's a masculine thing because all rivers, or almost all, I think almost all, maybe even all river gods in Latin are, are masculine. So to cross the Tiber, he says, or said, again, historical present, Patres. So we, we don't have an O patres here, but this is evocative. So fathers, well, he's not saying that he has dubious paternal relationships. He's saying, no, these are the fathers of the city, the, the elders. So O fathers, hey, hey, senators, to cross the Tiber and to enter, if I might be able, am able, this is what? This is a present active subjunctive. Of course, it's first person singular. So, possum, this is irregular, but it's just like the verb essay, to be. And we know that it's sim, sis, sit in the uh, singular conjugation. And then to make it possum, we just add these POS, POs in front of it. So, or POSs. I mean that in the best possible way. Uh, but that's what we've got going on here. So if you know the subjunctive forms of esse, to be, you know the subjunctive forms of the verb posse, to be able to. So if I am able, we might just translate that in a kind of positive, indicative English way, but if I am able, I, I want to cross the Tiber and to enter the castra. So this is our direct object. Again, this is plural camps, but can often just be used as a singular camp of the enemy. So this is from hostes, hostis, masculine, it can be feminine, but generally we're, we're talking about a, mas, uh, a masculine host. When we get that word host in English, it's coming from this, uh, means a group of enemies. So then we have this um, and we just saw that earlier in a third declension noun with, uh, where was that, consulum. So we have this um ending, which we knew was genitive plural for the third declension. Well, here we are again, third declension noun. Why do we get this extra I? Well, this is one of those I stem third declension nouns. Well, why? Well, there are a number of things that trigger I stem, but it helps when the noun, when it's nominative and genitive, are equal in the number of syllables they have. Hostes, hostis, both two syllables. The fancy word for that is perisyllabic, literally equal syllabled. So that's why we have this here, of the enemies, the camps. So in English word order, fathers of the country, I want to cross the Tiber and to enter, if I'm able to, enemy camps, the camp of the enemy. Non prido, so not as a, we, we need to supply, and it's frustrating because earlier we had ut transfuga right here, but here we were just able to say, well, what the title is, um, maybe because uh, Skywall is speaking and he's being a little bit more direct. He can be a little bit more confident about what he is or is not. So not as a prido, a kind of plunderer, a pirate, we might say, nor an ultor, an avenger, populationum. So this looks a lot like populus. It looks like it's related, but its meaning is quite different uh, because this is uh, plundering, pillaging, so what we might say then is that not as a pirate or kind of a robber, nor as an avenger of the plundering. And in Wecom, one of these uh, prepositional phrases, 
uh, phrase. Ter terribly written there. But we're saying vice versa, in turn, in response to the raids that have been going on uh, that Lars Porcena has been kind of perpetrating on the Roman people. That's why they're no longer safe in their fields. So not as a robber nor as a re avenger. And this word ultor has a lot of resonance in uh, kind of Roman religion. Mars is the ultor. Uh, there's a temple to him in Rome. Mars the avenger. War that if, if you are attacked, you will get back. So, of course, this is all, when, when Livy says this, his readers will be thinking about Mar Mars ultor. And they'll be thinking about where that temple is in Rome when it's fully developed, not when it's just this little town on the side of the Tiber that's being attacked by this Etruscan king, Porcena. So not, not for robbery or just a kind of tit-for-tat revenge is he going. Maius, greater. So we have, you know, ma, uh, Magnus, right? Large. But this is the comparative form. What does comparative mean? Well, we're comparing it to something. So it's not just large, it's larger. And Magnus is irregular on that. So we've got Maius here. So, and then this can work with a couple different genders. We'll see what it's working. So a greater thing, let's say right now it might be a man, it might be whatever. Greater, if the gods allow, uh, well not allow, aid. It's not about allowing something to happen, but actually kind of seeing it through. Greater, if the gods aid, in animo. So that's in my, we might say. But we don't have meo animo here. Latin with parts of the body and also just kind of ideas about the body, one's heart, one's mind, doesn't need that personal touch. It, it says, in, in a, well, in my soul or heart. Well, whose heart are we talking about other than me? So greater if the gods help in my heart is the faciness, the deed. Again, related to the verb facio, to do. So deed, also related to do in English, is a good word for this. So greater if the gods help in my heart, in my spirit, kind of in his desire here, is the deed. A probant patres. The fathers approve. So we don't know what this deed is. Um, uh, Lafleur notes that this is kind of setting up a sense of um, suspense, right? Because if you're familiar with the story, you kind of know what's going on, but nobody's talking about what exactly this fuckiness will be yet. We've already seen that... Uh, Skywola thinking, oh, well, if only some audacious and strong great deed were done, again, great, we, we might think Maius again, then things would change. But we don't know what this is uh, because it ends up being fairly gruesome in the end, even if that's not uh, uh, Gaius Mucius' original plan. It's not, his plan is pretty direct, but uh, when that first plan fails, as we'll see, uh, he does something that's even greater. So uh, I guess with that little bit of suspense, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.